Good morning to all of you for this uh, debate on hydrogen. The hydrogen debate, which has the wonderful title, Smoke and Mirrors or the Future of Green Energy. So really the, the basic question of is hydrogen, of which you hear so much about nowadays uh, on radio, TV, newspapers, is it overhyped? Or is it actually one of the key technologies, low carbon technologies that will bring us closer to net zero emissions uh, eventually by the mid century, which actually is what increasingly it seems international organizations like the IEA, International Energy Agency or IRENA are thinking not so much as kind of the, the silver bullet that will solve all the problems, but moreover, something that is an additional key technology, particularly for those sectors, which are very hard to decarbonize or to reach through electrification, further electrification with solar and, and, and wind energy. Now, even if it is identified as one of the key technologies, of course, we all know it is still relatively small and in its infancy. So the key questions are, if it's promising, but still small, how do we make it big? How do we scale it up? Famously, there is the so-called chicken and egg problem, meaning that those companies that can produce a lot of green hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen, they say, well, we will produce it. We can make it big, but we have to know that the demand is there. Where is the demand? Where is it coming from? And how big is it going to be? And those industries that might benefit from decarbonizing through low carbon hydrogen, they say, yes, we are ready to do it if it's cheap. And if it's massive scale production is available so where do we begin and then of course the issue of transportation how do you even make demand meet supply also physically it cannot always be in the same place how do we get the investment going how do we get the private investors on board now i am not going to answer all of these questions for you because i have this excellent outstanding panel with me that is going to help us face these questions and try to find some of the some of the answers let me introduce them to you they are uh, julia king and we will start with her in a minute she is the chair of the carbon trust and has a huge experience in the field of low carbon and also a hydrogen advisor to the uk government we also have uh, mike train who is a chief sustainability officer of, of Emerson and brings huge experience from the private sector on how to tackle these issues. Thirdly, we have Rosalinde van der Vlies, who is one of the top civil servants in the European Commission. And as, as we know, Europe is very, very advanced in this area and has very big ambitions uh, in this field. So she can tell us what is the latest news from Brussels? What is cooking? down there in Brussels. And, and last but not least, we have Andy Samuel, who is the chief executive of the Oil and Gas Authority of the UK government. And we also know that the UK is extremely ambitious in terms of low carbon policies and uh, including on hydrogen, green hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen. So we'll hear from Andy, who is, of course, knows what the companies are doing at the UK, um, in the UK, uh, North Sea, for instance. All right, let's kick off now our debate with, uh, with uh, Julia. And Julia, as I said, chair of the Carbon Trust in the UK and has been also the vice chair of uh, very important uh, commissions in, in, the, in the UK and currently advising also uh, on the hydrogen for the UK government. So Julia, if you if you look at this as this key question, what is going to be this role for hydrogen, for low carbon hydrogen? How 
how critical is it as, as a key technology in your view and your experience for the UK and actually for the world to achieve uh, net zero emissions? Julia. Well, well, thank you. I can talk most easily about, about the UK. And I think the thing that we noticed in the UK was when we changed our target from reducing our emissions by 80% by 2050 to reaching net zero in 2050, a decision we took in, or well, the, the parliament took in 2019, that's when hydrogen becomes important. It has a really important role to play, as you were saying in your introduction, in that in decarbonizing that last 20% of the difficult to address emissions. So we have this real challenge in a way that, that because you have to make hydrogen either from gas or from electricity, it's going to be more expensive than what you're making it from. So you're not going to use it as if you can use something else, you're not going to use it. On the other hand, there are these difficult to decarbonize sectors where you need it. Um, so it's a critical technology, but it's not going to take over everything. And I think in, in the UK, in our sort of core decarbonization scenarios, uh, we see hydrogen by 2050 providing about 25% of our total energy. That means we'll need, in terms of energy, a hydrogen system that's about as big as our electricity system today. So it's, it's a real opportunity, but it's not delivering um, the decarbonization solution for everything across the economy. But if you say that, Julia, um, twenty-five percent is, is 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 very significant, of course, uh, and so we have a, a long way to go to get to that twenty-five percent. So how, we do. how do you see it, that in the next the next like five to ten years? How, what can we what can we achieve? We do. I mean, today we produce about twenty-seven terawatt hours of of grey hydrogen. By twenty fifty, we need something like two hundred and seventy terawatt hours of uh, of green hydrogen, ideally. So we've got to, you know, scale this industry by an order of magnitude and change it from being a grey industry to being a, a green or a green and blue industry. Um, so I think the really key thing is is, and we're starting to get is that we government government needs to give a very, very clear sense of direction um, and be really committed to it. Uh, and we have that now in, in the government's, in the UK government's net zero strategy um, to, you know, targets for the amount of hydrogen. And then I think we do need to see government um, in the early phases almost um, working as a, a an intermediary to bring together the the uses with the production um, to to um, to make sure that people can see that there is a market for the hydrogen that they produce because we've got to overcome as you've said this this chicken and egg problem mm. and we've got to make sure we don't just focus on the the exciting bits of the you know the fuel cells and uh, and the electrolyzers but actually all of the rest of the system that we're going to need. How are we going to store the hydrogen? How are we going to transport the hydrogen? What sort of special compressors are we going to need? What sort of materials are we going to need? What sort of standards will enable all of this to work? All of that sort of stuff that seems sort of less exciting somehow than than the uh, the key what people see as the key technologies. Okay, great, uh, Julia. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is uh, very important, this energy system approach uh, that you are basically advocating and bringing everything together and including what you call the, the boring stuff, the, 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 the transportation, the storage, etc. So let, well, we'll, we will circle back to you in, in, our, in our subsequent debate, I'm sure, uh, uh, Julia. Um, but let's now, now draw in uh, Mike. Mike, so you come also from with a different perspective also from uh, working uh, obviously in, in the private sector, uh, having worked uh, in the US, but also in, in, in Asia. So you bring also this, this broader perspective and you have also a lot of experience I saw in the, in the, digital, in the digital sector. So you can have, a, 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 I'm sure, a, a great uh, overview of that. So what, what, is the, what is the private sector uh, appetite at the moment, uh, Mike, for, uh, for, for jumping into this, uh, into this new opportunity of uh, of hydrogen, how do how do you see it? Please. 
You know, first of all, I want to thank you and my my colleagues here and the economists for convening this. I think this is an awesome discussion, and I look forward to the discussion as well. You know, on the private sector side of the world, hydrogen's kind of come way up uh, into conversation, especially these last couple of years. You know, I think everybody is they're trying to plan energy transition. You know, and testing all of the use cases across everything we do, whether that's in the generation or movements or the use cases. You know, we're all trying to figure out. You know, where we, I think we're trying to figure out how to solve for these things. And, and we can't electrify everything. That's obviously a goal because that gives you the opportunity to do some other things with, with, with generation and emissions and those kinds of things. Um, and I think people have come to the realization you need an electron, but you can't get wires to every part of the world. We're going to need a molecule. And I think people are leaning into hydrogen as that, call it that portable molecule that we can, that we can transfer into, as Julia described, and then transfer out of in use cases. Uh, it's very complex. It's very tricky. We we we're looking at use cases. Everybody's designing their roadmaps. There's transportation use cases. There are uh, just blending to reduce use cases. Now, uh, obviously, we, if you need it distributed, you need it available. How do you have distributed hydrogen available for use cases? And then ultimately, sort of that green hydrogen power nirvana solution, where you can use the molecule to help kind of time shift some of the renewable uh, generation capability. So I think hydrogen's kind of settling into, at least the way I'm viewing it now, and some of the projects we're seeing around the world uh, is to get some hydrogen up and running, get some distributed hydrogen available. I think a lot of people want to test use cases around, you know, large trucks and, and maybe hard to abate industries, some pilots, some experiments in the steel and cement industries, for example. Um, so really focused on that. And then over the longer term, how do we build this capacity, right? This bigger capacity to support those use cases. And then ultimately, how do we get that to the to the green level everybody's looking for? Um, we're, we're kind of privileged at Emerson. We sit in the automation of all of the different forms of energy. So we're getting to watch all of the conversations and participate in them. And I think this hydrogen one, at least my personal view, is extremely important to be able to have that hydrogen molecule available to solve some of these use cases. I'm looking for it in our own roadmaps. I need decarbonized steel from the products, my boring products, as Julia highlighted, that we make so we could support uh, these infrastructures going forward. And I've got to turn to those steel makers and ask them to try these things and see if we can find those solutions. So so I think a lot of a lot of discussion there, Noah, a lot of activity going on right now. A lot of we need we need some at scale things to get built which we're trying to do. Uh, I think you're familiar with the Poseidon project there in the Netherlands. We're getting to participate in the, the automation of that offshore wind uh, electrolyzer, you know, bring it onshore use case. Um, we just got to go faster. And I think as to Julia's point, we all got to be working together to make these things happen. But you see that as uh, Mike, you see that as uh something that 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 we can that we can see really emerging already significantly in the next 10 years. That so-called yes. green steel, steel produced with zero emissions from with hydrogen. You see that coming? We have to. We've got to try it. We got to get in there again. They'll electrify part of it. They'll they'll have renewable en en energy inputs, but for some of those really high temperature processes, right now hydrogen is kind of the only thing in the roadmap that's going to make sense. And we got to go get those trials and make sure that it can work. Okay. Okay. Great, Mike. Well, uh, again, uh, we'll also come back to you, I'm sure, with, with, with your experience in this debate. But let me now move to uh, to our third uh, speaker in the panel, uh, which is uh, uh, Rosalinde uh, van der Vlies, uh, as I said, working for the European Commission in the in the Director Journal for, for Research and Innovation. And obviously, we need a hell of a lot of innovation to, to make this work. Um, so Rosalinde, can you update us? Maybe we know already that the Commission, of course, is is, is extremely active in this in this area, and uh, now recently uh, has announced, uh, yeah, even an acceleration of that. Uh, so maybe you can bring us up to speed on on, on what's coming from Brussels. No, absolutely, and uh, and good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, and uh, I would like to to start by picking up what Julia just said. You know, of the the role of the government to really act as this intermediate to basically make sure um, that all the players on the market that they have a stable regulatory framework uh, that will really you know support both the supply and demand side, and also make sure that you know there is 
some certainty for investors that this is really something uh, that the governments are behind. And from the Commission's perspective, I mean, you're all familiar, of course, with our European Green Deal strategy, uh, where we want Europe to become the first climate neutral continent uh, by 2050. And we have set ourselves on a pathway to a 55% reduction target by 2030. So it's extremely clear that hydrogen, and in particular, renewable hydrogen, plays a key role uh, in this transition. Um, so we have adopted uh, at EU level a strategy for hydrogen, uh, and we're not the only ones. I think there are many countries, not only in the EU, but across the globe that have adopted national strategies. I think this is really extremely important to provide this longer term certainty. We have set in the initial hydrogen strategy that we want to come to a production of 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen inside the EU by 2030. But it's very clear uh, that with the recent uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, there is a very, very clear case to speed up and to accelerate really the clean, the clean energy transitions uh, in, in Europe and beyond. Um, so it's very clear um, that we will be focusing on accelerating uh, the path towards building uh, the clean hydrogen economy. Um, we have adopted uh, our adaptations to our regulatory framework, which in the Brussels bubble we call the Fit for 55 packages. Now, when I spoke about it to my family in the Netherlands, uh, they were thinking that we were all collectively going to the gym. So I had to explain that Fit for 55 basically meant that we really want to make sure that all the regulations we have in the EU are there to go and help us to get to this 55% uh, reduction target. Uh, and if we are basically implementing our Fit for 55 packages, um, the predictions are that we will already reduce our gas consumption uh, by 23% by 2030. But of course, we now have these packages uh, in co-decision, which means that the European Parliament and the EU member states can have a say on this. So we may even see a further strengthening of our targets that are linked to energy efficiency and the use of renewable energies. So I do believe that this is really the momentum where we have to work together and act in order to roll out uh, also the renewable hydrogen economy. Uh, from the Commission side, we are also very closely working together with industry, which we have been doing for many years already. Um, for the next seven years, we will be co-investing 2 billion euros uh, in rolling out the hydrogen economy, focusing on the entire value chain. So, you know, we want to increase the production capacity, but we also want to find smart solutions to reduce the cost for distribution uh, and storage, and of course, to stimulate the end use applications. And I do believe that we really need to make sure that we have, you know, a regulatory environment that supports the rollout of the hydrogen economy, that we need to stimulate investments, both the public and private investments, and we need to cooperate globally. Uh, because it's very clear that, of course, if we focus on renewable hydrogen, uh, we also need sufficient renewable energies uh, in order to produce. And, and there, I do believe that only if we work strategically together across borders and even across the borders of the EU, uh, that we will be getting there. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rosalinda, for, uh, for this uh... Uh, view from uh, from Brussels and uh, any for stressing the need for strong uh, global cooperation um, because you mentioned indeed the targets for uh, for ramping up uh, very rapidly uh, renewable hydrogen in the European Union for 2030 um, but as I understand it it's it's also a strategy which not only counts on the on the domestic uh, production, but also on, uh, which underlines your point on global cooperation, also on, on imports, you know, and cooperating with uh, neighboring regions. Maybe you can say a few words about that, Rosalinda. Yes, no, I think it is extremely important. And I mean, the international dimension uh, has already been firmly embedded in the in the hydrogen strategy. Um, the Commission also uh, published a joint action plan uh, to really accelerate now the transition uh, for to affordable, secure and sustainable energy. Uh, and this will be further elaborated also with the member states, where also, of course, imports uh, will become extremely important in order to even increase um, the, uh, the amount of renewable hydrogen uh, in the European Union. Uh, and also we need this global cooperation also to drive down the costs. 
Uh, and in this context, for instance, the Commission is very active in mission innovation, which has a dedicated mission on clean hydrogen. Uh, and this mission aims to drive down the costs uh, of uh, hydrogen uh, to 1.8 euro or 2 US dollar uh, by, by 2030, and also to uh, ramp up the building of what we call hydrogen valleys. Uh, we want to have at least 100 hydrogen valleys uh, worldwide by 2030. And I believe in particular these hydrogen valleys that really showcase how the hydrogen economy can work in a dedicated geographical area, really again covering the full value chain from production to distribution, storage and end use applications. I think this is really key to accelerate these transitions. And these hydrogen valleys can also then make sure that we develop the hydrogen economy you know, across the whole of the European Union, not only focusing on, on certain geographical areas. But I do believe, you know, international cooperation will be key, in particular also to drive down costs. Yes, okay, great. Thank you, uh, Rosalinde. Um, let me uh, then bring in uh, Andy. Andy, um, you, uh, we've heard from, from you in, uh, in your earlier presentation about uh, the, the tremendous uh, momentum also in the UK for developing all kinds of uh, hydrogen projects, uh, both uh, blue hydrogen, with, uh, which uses gas and carbon capture and storage, as well as uh, green hydrogen from, uh, produced from renewable. Um, so could you elaborate a, a bit more, Andy, on, on, on how you how you see this developing this momentum and particularly what what do you think now is key to to really make this happen yeah, because one thing is you know good plans uh, nice projects but uh, yeah the, the the implementation on the ground is sometimes tough so what what do you consider are kind of the key factors to to really make it happen and to uh, make the uk uh, a big uh, power player power player in the in this field Sure, thank you. And it's um, great to be here with such a, a fine group of panelists and maybe picking up on some of the, the remarks already made. It was really interesting, Julia's point around that change in the legislation to from 80% to net zero. And it was absolutely after that that we and the Oil and Gas Authority started to get more and more inquiries from serious investors about hydrogen. And you know, that for me is the acid test when people are wanting to invest real capital and, and get real momentum going and they absolutely are you saw the number of projects um 12 gigawatts of uh blue hydrogen capacity wanting to come on stream for 2030 far exceeding the uk government's target of five gigawatts so all the signs are there that, that the money wants to come in um i think as Roslyn said current geopolitics only should accelerate that trend quite rightly and it's not a case of blue versus green. I think I think we need both and we need to make a start. I, I hadn't heard the term hydrogen valleys before, but I am very familiar with kind of hubs. And uh, in the northeast of Scotland, for example, we have the energy transition zone very much looking at getting things going. We've already got hydrogen buses and other uses. But we need to take that to a whole different scale. And I'm very confident that will happen. Um, all along the East Coast, we've got huge potential. I talked about the uh, the big projects associated with the uh, Track 1 CCS clusters, which are getting excellent support from the, the UK government. I do think the thing that brings us together, we talked about needing that systemic view, are the governments who have that, that overarching view and can actually look at all the different bits and make sure it happens together. And I'm very encouraged in the UK um, there's amazing policy work ongoing with some very, very bright civil servants because some of the detail is actually quite complicated and how you make sure that uh, it does actually work and all the risks are mitigated, people can create value fairly, um, but not you know in the extreme. But all the work that I'm seeing, and it joins up obviously with Blue with the CCS, is it's very well thought through. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that come together, like I say, with the heads of terms by the end of this year. And then finally, I'm also on the board of the Net Zero Technology Center and hugely encouraged by some of the innovations I'm starting to come through on technology. And I do think that's got a, a long way to go. Again, it's getting very good support from investors, but also the UK government. And I think we're gonna see huge inroads. 
I expect that we'll see costs come down in all of these technologies much quicker than people currently forecast. Well, great. That, that's uh, an, an, a very uplifting message, Andy, that we, we all like to hear, that the costs are going to come down faster than, than what we many, many uh, experts uh, expect, uh, which actually is, of course, what we have seen also 10, 15 years ago with wind and solar. Uh, also, those costs have come down much faster than we really expected 10, 15 years ago. So hopefully the same will happen. But Andy, if I can, if I can push you a little bit on, uh, you know, this, this very heated debate uh, on, on blue hydrogen, because uh, as you may know, uh, or I'm sure you all know, is that, you know, uh, uh, particularly NGOs and, and also others are, uh, other experts sometimes say, you know, this is, yeah, they are lukewarm or if not very critical on, on blue hydrogen in terms of, uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, that we may, it may keep us longer, has this famous lock-in effect on, uh, on, on, on fossil fuels. And as well as, uh, you know, do we pay enough attention or do people to pay enough attention to controlling and to slashing the methane emissions, which are also quite critical. Well, what's your, how do you respond to, to those, uh, to those uh, uh, critical voices and to those uh, voices? Sure. I mean, I, I think the key is we need clean hydrogen. Um, so if we're going to do it through natural gas, that needs to be clean. In the UK, working with industry, we've reduced methane emissions um, 22% and 20% the last two years. And, uh, you know, we're demonstrating kind of global track record, the Norwegians likewise. So that for me would pass the test of uh, what I would call clean hydrogen. Um, and and as, as, as we've talked about these valleys or hubs, I think some of the places we can get going the quickest are around those hubs where we have existing gas infrastructure where the transformation, therefore, to a hydrogen system is can, can happen quicker. If that actually then opens up the pathway more rapidly for green hydrogen and the costs come down, and that displaces the blue quicker than the 2040s, which is, I think, where it's currently predicted, great. Um, I don't think anyone's going to fight that. The sooner the better. Uh, I think also, I think some NGOs were concerned that oil and gas companies were using it almost as a fig leaf to kind of prolong their operations. I think things are changing very quickly. And certainly many of the companies I'm working with are now the same companies who are have been successful bidding in Scotland. So in, in the UK, 25 gigawatt of uh, you know generation capacity potentially going to be coming on. A lot of that floating offshore wind, that is going to require the kind of deep expertise and transferable technologies from the oil and gas sector. So I think the old distinctions are no longer so helpful or actually valid. We all need to work together, as Rosalind says, collaborate in new ways and just get on with everything. Um, and the more options and diversity I think we have in an ever more complicated and political world, probably the better. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for, uh, for that, uh, Andy. That's, uh, that's very helpful. So uh, as usual with uh, nice and good debates, uh, time is uh, marching and time is running very fast. Um, we have uh, some, uh, some 10 minutes left now. Um, let, me, uh, let me turn um, to all of you with, with the following question. So um, as we heard in, the, in, your, in, your, in basically all of your contributions, the, the drive for uh, uh, mitigating climate change, uh, achieving net zero emissions, doing this, the, you know, the last 20%, as, as Julia called it, and, and Andy, that was a big driver for uh, getting clean hydrogen on the, uh, on the agenda and getting all these strategies going uh, in, many, in many constituencies. Um, now, the question is that I have for all of you is with the current uh, crisis uh, or the war in Ukraine uh, going on um, and, and the new heightened awareness of security of supply and the uh, urgency of uh, perhaps uh, reducing uh, fossil fuel imports, uh, is that going to become 
Of course, everything is very, you know, very recent uh, horrific events. But is that potentially going to become a next, a new driver for, uh, well, basically uh, also clean hydrogen, not only clean hydrogen, but basically everything that uh, can reduce or can replace potentially longer term fossil fuel imports to uh, power plants, to industry, uh, to heating, uh, etc. Can I can I ask all of you what your kind of your two cents is on this? Uh, because of course that's very you know that's the current events and it's very early days. I know, but what what's your sense when you look with your experience to this to this question? Uh, can I start with you again, Julia? Uh, well, I think it's absolutely moving people to uh, to think more about green hydrogen. And I think, you know, in an ideal world, that would be great. But I think we have to be realistic, which is, um, you know, in, in the UK, we currently, our central sort of scenarios see uh, about um, 40 or 50% of our hydrogen coming from electrolysis by 2050 and about 30% um, of it still coming from gas with carbon capture and storage. The implications of uh, making all of that electrolytic hydrogen on the scale of the electricity system uh, that we're going to need by 2050 are enormous. We're already uh, looking to expand our offshore wind from about 10 gigawatts today to 40 gigawatts by 2030 to needing something of the order of 100 gigawatts by, by 2050. And I think we have to think, is it realistic that we could be, uh, you know, looking to 200 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050, if we really want to provide all of our hydrogen from um, green hydrogen from an electrolytic route. So I think that I think there's likely still to be a balance, uh, and it's mm. going to be it's going to be hard to get to say we will only have green electrolytic hydrogen. But of course, also will be absolutely critical is what's going to happen to the gas price longer term. Um, because that, of course, will change the economics between blue and green very significantly, as it you know as it already does from today, so to speak. Exactly. So it seems like gas prices, of course, are have skyrocketed, and they don't seem to be coming down uh, anytime soon. So that might so, so electrolytic, make blue electrolytic hydrogen. hydrogen suddenly looks like quite a bargain. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, so you 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 you're, you're saying yes. Uh, post the drive might be there to accelerate, but it's it's going to be tough. It's um, going to be tough because we, you know, we've got to ex we've got to accelerate the ele electricity infrastructure, and we've already got a big challenge because, of course, getting to net zero is a lot about electrification. So it already yeah. requires a big expansion of the electricity system, and this just yeah. puts more pressure on that. Yeah. Okay, Mike. How do you see that from your from your perspective in uh, in, in in different con different uh, region, of course. How do you see this? Is this going to be a new driver? You know, I think the energy security discussion, wherever you are in the world, has been front and center for a lot of countries, right? There, uh, people are looking at this. Uh, having the optionality, I think, as we go forward and pass through these phases of development, I think grids are incredibly important, grids for the molecules and leveraging existing infrastructures, you know, is kind of the early days of trying to utilize hydrogen. You know, over time, uh, obviously, those will there'll be more hydrogen features. I think there'll be carbon dioxide being moved around, so I can go to sequestration points. Water with electrolyzers comes back into focus. We're going to be moving water around more, so that those grids and and the infrastructures we have for those are critical. And I think we got to keep pushing on those. And the electron grids, obviously, uh, taking more loads. They they need to expand. They need to be smarter. We need to use signaling and demand management. And all those kinds of things. So, I, so I'd put one focus on the grids and everything going on. I think the other thing is if you're trying to be urgent and get things rolling from a private sector standpoint, you know, the bigger companies have the ability to mobilize and move things. And then we have these new and emerging customers who are smaller, have novel ideas, and we, they need to be nurtured. You know, we're, we're 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 blessed. We're getting to work with both sets of those companies and help them. And again, using kind of the economic muscle and the innovation muscle at the same time to make that happen. One I wanted to highlight for you, just a couple of the friends that we work with, we work with a group in the US called Biotech, who is doing a natural gas to hydrogen conversion distributed 
you know, um, manufactured in, in a factory so they can be deployed. Uh, right now, they're going to deploy a unit in Savick Farms, which is in northeast Scotland, which was referenced a moment ago. They're going to use that biomethane from agricultural waste to create that gas. So that's a nice step forward in terms of that the uh, quality of that hydrogen. And then our friends at JCB in the UK who make agriculture and construction equipment, you know, they have a delivered fuels type of in use case. You know, we, we'd have the ability, they showed a very nice prototype at COP26 or in the green zone of a hydrogen combustion tractor. You know, you can kind of start to see the pieces of this happening. I think we just need to nurture it and push it forward, you know, as fast as we can. Okay, great, Mike. Let me turn to you, uh, Rosalinde. What, what do you think, uh, looking uh, at this question from, from Brussels, is this going to be an accelerator for hydrogen? Absolutely. This is uh, absolutely the clear uh, expectation that this will definitely be uh, the accelerator. I think we will see in particular three things. First of all, a renewed push to boost the production processes uh, of renewable hydrogen in the EU, but also a renewed focus on imports. Uh, secondly, I think we will see much more investments uh, in scaling up and deployment. Uh, as you know, we have at EU level several programs that really focus on uh, scaling up uh, solutions such as the ETS Innovation Fund, Invest EU, and also the Catalyst Fund uh, that we uh, have signed with Breakthrough uh, Energy. And I really think that there will be much more emphasis now also, you know, on this scaling up and deployment, including with European uh, investments. Uh, thirdly, I think we will again um, try to cooperate even more at the national level with the member states. Uh, we have the recovery and resilience facility where we are really supporting member states also to roll out the gas and hydrogen infrastructure. Through our Fit for 55 proposals, we also uh, would like to have a regulatory framework that is supportive of building really these infrastructures uh, for hydrogen, but also for, for storage, uh, for example, and looking at port infrastructures. So I really think that you will see all also a lot of renewed cooperation uh, between the European Commission and the EU member states, for instance, in the context of state aid, so that we can also really mobilize and accelerate the national investments uh, towards accelerating the, the hydrogen economy. So I think it will be really a very, very, very important factor in the weeks okay. and months to come. Okay, okay, great. Thank you for your fair. Thank you for that, uh, Rosalinde. Uh, Andy, uh, you've and uh, when I go, come to you, how do you see this from uh, from your perspective? Do you see this going to be uh, in, the, in the UK also accelerating or not so much? Sure. I, I think it's been very well put by everyone beforehand, and I, I fully agree. I think specifically in the UK, it's already a challenge, as Julia's put out. But um, there is good work underway. Certainly, I'm now working with others on what we call spatial planning for the North Sea, how we best combine and optimize all these different technologies and do it in a very strategic, systemic way. Uh, we've talked about the technology. I think that will only accelerate. And I think, you know, key, particularly obviously to the green, is at the moment it takes about 10 years from award to operations of, a, of, of an OSHA wind farm. There's a very good challenge to get that down to five years without bypassing any of the very necessary consents. I think things like that should now be absolutely top of the list. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Andy. Um, as I said before, um, time is going very fast, uh, so I'm afraid we have to leave it at that. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to uh, thank my panel, my panelists, my outstanding panelists, I have to say, for their, their excellent contributions. Uh, we didn't have that much time, but you, uh, you covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm not going to try to summarize, uh, except saying I, I, I took away a couple of, uh, a couple of points uh, definitely from, from all of you in terms of the, the critical contribution that uh, hydrogen can make, clean hydrogen can make for re achieving net zero emissions, and particularly in those uh, hard to abate sectors, uh, that uh, we have to move uh, even faster to uh, probably achieve that. We have already ambitious targets, but uh, also the new situation with uh, heightened 
awareness of uh, security of supply issues and trying to reduce fossil fuels might become an, uh, an additional driver. We have to look at the whole system, something that you uh, all of you have uh, very much uh, emphasized. It's not only an issue of how to create a demand or how to uh, get the, pro the production going, uh, but it's also the, what Julia called the, the boring stuff, the uh, how do you connect everything, the pipelines, the repurposed pipelines, the, 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 the shipping, the infrastructure issues, the distributed the distributed uh, uh, distribution, sorry, uh, as Mike has uh, has emphasized. So um, all of that is going to be uh, critical. Um, so if we have to ask the question, or the, sorry, respond to the question, smoke and mirrors or the future of green energy, I think we are beyond the smoke, the smoke and mirrors and 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 the hype. We are definitely becoming into the the area of green and and low carbon hydrogen becoming. A reality investment, as Andy has uh, mentioned, investment is flowing. Companies are, have a big appetite, uh, and uh, as Rosalinda mentioned, the global cooperation in all of this is also going to be critical to scale it up uh, in in global cooperation as soon as we can to get the cost down as soon as we can, and to uh, make it part of the future portfolio of uh, low carbon technologies. Thank you so much. And uh, to the audience, I would like to say stay tuned because this is not the last panel. Even more exciting stuff is coming.